Hi everyone. Welcome to chapter three, biological macromolecules. Hopefully you remember that we are continuing to talk about one of the unifying characteristics of all living organisms, and that characteristic is order. We have been discussing from the very most basic level how living organisms are structured, and in chapter two, we got some chemistry basics down so that we could continue to discuss how living organisms are structured on a molecular level. In this chapter, we're going to continue that discussion by talking about biological macromolecules, but we're going to start the discussion in what might be sort of a non-intuitive place. We're gonna start by talking about what Earth was like 4.5 billion years ago, shortly after the planet was formed. So the earliest history of Earth um, was called the Hadean period, and here is a depiction of what that period may have looked like based upon our understanding of the geological evidence from that time. Um, the Hadean period was named for the Greek god of the underworld, Hades, because the conditions at that time, as you can see, resembled hell. Uh, the Earth had just formed, the planet was extremely hot, and it was being bombarded by meteors, meteorites, um, and at some point we know that what we now refer to as the moon came and crashed into Earth, and then it broke off and began to orbit around the planet. There was very little water, and any water that was there was essentially all vapor and no liquid, um, so the importance of water that we talked about in our last lecture was kind of moot. Uh, the atmosphere consisted mostly of carbon dioxide, methane, and ammonia, so sounds like a terrible place to live, right? Nobody wants to live there. However, there is good evidence that it was during this very time period that the beginnings of life on Earth were starting to form. The sort of landmark experiment that provided this evidence came in the 1950s and was carried out by a pair of scientists named Stanley Miller and Harold Urey. And what they hypothesized was that lightning in the early atmosphere of the Earth during this Hadean period could have catalyzed chemical reactions that would have generated complex organic molecules, which are the sorts of compounds that make up living organisms. And so what they did is they simulated the Hadean period conditions by creating this closed loop system that you see pictured on the slide right here. Um, a system of tubes that contain the sorts of gases that were present at the time of the Hadean period, which is methane, water vapor, hydrogen gas, and ammonia. And then they simulated a sort of hydrological cycle by heating up a sample of water into gas, allowing it to pass through a system of tubes that would carry it to a chamber where it would be exposed to a spark, which was meant to simulate lightning. Um, in that chamber, chemical reactions would occur on the gases in the atmosphere, and then the water would be condensed back down and then trapped in this lower basin uh, where anything that was created in the upper chamber would be collected and then analyzed to determine whether it is possible for the compounds that comprise living organisms to be formed in this sort of environment. So when they checked out what was left over in this basin, what sorts of things do you think they were expecting to find? Obviously, they weren't going to find an entire fully formed living organism in that chamber. They weren't looking in there to see if they had somehow managed to create a cat or something like that. Rather, they were looking for the tiny molecules that are the basis for living organisms. So what are those molecules? What molecules make up living organisms? You actually know a lot more about this than you think you do. And the reason why you know these things is because we eat living organisms all the time. Virtually everything that you eat in your diet, with the exception of minerals like salt, uh, is a living organism or once was a part of a living organism. From meats to dairy to eggs to fruits and vegetables, all of these things came from living organisms. So to know what sorts of molecules make up living things, all you have to think about is what's inside of your food. And it turns out if you are familiar with a nutrition label, like the one that you see up here, you already have a pretty good idea of what those molecules are. 
In fact, there are four categories of biological macromolecules that are thought to be the basic scaffolding of living organisms. And those four classes of biological macromolecules are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. All of them are called macromolecules because, well, it's on the name. Macro means really big, right? And so a macromolecule is a very large molecule that is made up of smaller molecular units. Out of these four categories, three of them can be found on your standard nutrition label. Total fat, which you see up here at the top. Fat is the colloquial language term for a lipid. So this is your lipids. You have your carbohydrates here. You have your proteins down here. And the last one that's not present on the nutrition label is the nucleic acids. And that's because the nucleic acids is things like DNA, which although it is present in all living organisms and therefore you do eat DNA, it doesn't have any sort of a nutritional value to you. And so it's not on the nutrition label. So in this lecture, what we're going to be doing is looking at each of these four categories of biological macromolecules one by one, and we're going to talk about how they are structured and what sort of role they play inside of living organisms. And as we do this, we're going to be cognizant of the fact that all these macromolecules are made up of, as we saw before, smaller molecular units. So all of these macromolecules are made of what we refer to as monomers. A monomer is defined as a single molecule that can be combined with other molecules like it in order to create these larger macromolecular structures. The term monomer makes sense to us because the prefix mono means one. So a monomer is a single molecule, a single molecular building block that be, can be combined with other building blocks to make polymers. Most macromolecules are considered polymers, which are chains of monomers put together. The prefix poly means multiple, and so therefore a polymer is a chain of multiple monomers that are put together. Now, the building blocks of every type of macromolecule look different from each other, by which I mean the building blocks of a carbohydrate are different from the building blocks of a protein, for example. However, they do have some things in common with each other. And one of the things that they have in common is the way that they get bonded together in order to make these larger molecular structures. There is a specific type of chemical reaction called a dehydration synthesis reaction, which occurs in order to link the individual monomers together to form the larger polymers or macromolecules. While every macromolecule's monomers are structured differently, as I mentioned, they do have in common that they have specific types of functional groups on them that are made of specific types of atoms. So we can see one monomer represented over here as this yellow block, and we can see on the right hand side of it there is an oxygen and a hydrogen sticking off of it. On this one over here, we can see that it is identical to the one on the left, and on the left hand side there is a hydrogen here. A dehydration synthesis reaction will take these two building blocks and it will put them together, combine them into one by joining them. And as it does so, it will kick out a molecule of water that is formed in the process, which is why it's called a dehydration synthesis reaction. Dehydration means loss of water. And that's exactly what goes on in this type of reaction that joins together these two monomers. So let's take a look at an animation of this reaction on the next slide here. The monomers come together. The two hydrogens and oxygen are bonded to form a water molecule, which leaves. And when that water molecule leaves, it seals together a bond between those adjacent monomers. And now they've linked together into a small polymer. So let's think about when this sort of reaction might happen in our own bodies. 
Um, let's say you've just had a workout and your body is working to build muscle tissue. It will take the individual monomers, the building blocks of proteins, and put them together to make the sorts of proteins that are necessary to build muscle tissues. Of course, the opposite happens as well, right? Um, living organisms not only build up large molecules, but they also need to break down large molecules. Uh, obviously, this happens, for example, when you are digesting your food. You ingest large molecules like proteins and carbohydrates, and your body needs to break them down in order to obtain energy and nutrition from them. So the opposite sort of reaction to a dehydration reaction is called a hydrolysis reaction. Hydrolysis reaction is named for the fact that it again involves water, hydro means water, and the term lysis literally means to split or to break apart. So hydrolysis means to break apart the monomers by adding a water molecule that splits their bond between them. And as we will see on the next slide in the animation, the hydrolysis reaction is precisely the opposite of the dehydration reaction. The water molecule will come and break the bond between the two monomers, and then the monomers will be split apart. So that should provide you some solid background on how each of these four classes of macromolecules gets formed. And we're going to see these principles of dehydration synthesis reactions occur over and over again with each of these four categories as we walk through them. The last sort of piece of foundational stuff that we need to talk about before we get into the actual nitty gritty details of these four categories is these things called functional groups. So functional groups are described as specific patterns of bonded atoms that are seen over and over again in nature. And I want you guys to be able to recognize four such specific patterns and know the names of them. One of these patterns is called a hydroxyl group. And a hydroxyl group is a very simple functional group because it is nothing more than an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. So that's called a hydroxyl group. Next is a carboxylic acid group, which is also sometimes simply referred to as a carboxyl group. A carboxylic acid group is a carbon atom that has a double bond to an oxygen atom and a single bond to what is effectively a hydroxyl group, an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. This is named a carboxylic acid group because anything that possesses this specific pattern of bonded atoms in it is acidic in nature. Next is a phosphate group. A phosphate group is named for the fact that it has a central atom of phosphorus that is surrounded by four oxygen atoms, two of which are bonded additionally to a hydrogen atom. And then finally, we have an amino group. And an amino group is a nitrogen atom that is bonded to at least two hydrogen atoms here. So as we walk through these four categories of macromolecules, you will be able to see these various functional groups present, and I want you to be able to recognize them and identify them on site. So let's get started with these four categories. We are going to start with the first category on here, which is the carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are composed of monomers that are called monosaccharides. And monosaccharides is the fancy word for sugars. So carbohydrates are very large molecules that within them are individually made up of building blocks called sugars. The structure of a monosaccharide is that it's composed of a ring of carbon atoms that have attached hydroxyl groups. And recall that those hydroxyl groups are an oxygen that is bonded to a hydrogen, so a very small, simple functional group. There are too many different types of monosaccharides to name, but you can see a few examples here that you may recognize. Right here we have glucose, one type of sugar. Here we have galactose. Over here we have fructose. And you can see in all three examples we have carbon in a ring and then hydroxyl groups around the outside. Another thing that they have in common with each other is that the name always ends in O-S-E-O-S, -E -os, 
So you can tell if something is a sugar or a monosaccharide if the ending is OSE. Glucose, galactose, fructose, um, maltose, lactose, uh, all of these different oses are monosaccharides and the building blocks of carbohydrates. Let's take a little bit closer look at one of those building blocks. Here's a closer look at glucose. And let's take a look at how individual building blocks, individual glucoses, come together to make a larger carbohydrate. Here we have two glucoses next to each other, but they're not bonded yet. Here they exist simply as monomers that have yet to become a polymer or a macromolecule. We can see that on the left-hand glucose, there is a hydroxyl group that's sticking up that I've highlighted with a red box. And on the right-hand glucose, there is another hydroxyl group that is sticking downward. And on this one, I've only highlighted its hydrogen here. I've highlighted these atoms because these are the ones that are going to participate in the dehydration reaction and come together to form a water molecule that is spit out from these two glucoses. So what will happen is these three atoms will go away and join together with each other in order to form a molecule of water, H2O, which you can see up at the top here. When those atoms leave, the partners that they've left behind now need something new to bond to. And so the two glucose molecules will become joined between the carbon on the left and the oxygen on the right, yielding what's called a disaccharide, two monosaccharides put together here. Now, this in itself is not a carbohydrate, but when this sort of reaction happens over and over again, then you get a long chain of monosaccharides that is effectively a carbohydrate molecule. What is the biological role of carbohydrates? What do they do for living organisms? You probably already know that carbohydrates are an energy-dense molecule that are sometimes used in energy storage, but you may not know that some carbohydrates are also used for structure. For example, the cell wall of a plant cell, which we'll talk more about later, is composed of a specific type of carbohydrate called cellulose. So they are versatile molecules in that they can use for both, be used for both energy storage as well as structure. This brings us to our first checkpoint of the lecture, where I want you to tell me how many water molecules would be generated and kicked out from the dehydration reactions required to build a carbohydrate chain made of five monomers, five monosaccharides put together. And it may be helpful to just do a rough sketch of what this might look like without including any details to show how many different bonds are being formed in order to get a chain of five monomers. So that completes our discussion about carbohydrates. And next up on our list of macromolecule classes is the lipids. So as we know, every type of macromolecule is made of a different type of building block. And we saw that carbohydrates were composed of monosaccharides. Lipids, on the other hand, are composed of multiple chains that are called fatty acids that are linked to a molecule of glycerol. We can see on the left-hand side what a molecule of glycerol looks like, and we can see on the right-hand side what a long fatty acid chain looks like, um, essentially a chain of carbons with hydrogen sticking off of it. And the length of the chain of the fatty acid can vary, and depending upon how long it is, is what defines what type of oil or fat you are talking about. This particular fatty acid that you see on the screen has 11 carbons in its chain, and it is called lauric acid and is the fatty acid commonly found in coconut oil. If we take another look at this fatty acid, we can see that there is a cluster or a functional group on the left-hand side of it. And in this checkpoint here, what I want you to do is tell me what is the identity of that functional group. Which of the four functional groups of the ones that we talked about are we looking at here? Now previously we took a look at a dehydration reaction that brought together multiple molecules of glucose 
in order to form a carbohydrate. And here, what we're going to do is look at the dehydration reactions that would be involved in building what's called a triglyceride, which is the sort of lipid that stores fat in your body. It's called a triglyceride because the prefix meaning tri refers to the fact that it contains three fatty acid chains attached to this glycerol. So we have an extended uh, molecular structure a glycerol that has sort of been lengthened here on the left hand side in order to accommodate us. And we have three identical fatty acid chains on the right hand side. Each of these fatty acid chains is going to undergo a dehydration reaction with one of the hydroxyl groups that we see sticking off of this glycerol molecule. So I'll highlight again the atoms that are involved in this process. On the glycerol on the left hand side, I've highlighted the hydrogens, and on the right hand side, I've hydro uh, highlighted the hydrogen and oxygens, which will come together in order to form three water molecules, one for each dehydration reaction that happens between the glycerol and the fatty acid. And that, of course, again, leaves behind the opportunity for the glycerol to form a new bond to each fatty acid molecule here. And this is what your final complete triglyceride looks like. So we just saw how a type of common lipid called a triglyceride was formed, but there's another type of specialized lipid that we need to discuss again, and that is a phospholipid. Now we briefly mentioned phospholipids previously in our lecture when we were discussing water and the hydrophobic effect. You may remember that from our last lecture. But a phospholipid, um, the structure of it is similar to a regular lipid, but the exception is that instead of having three fatty acid chains, it has only two fatty acid chains attached to the glycerol molecule here. And in place of the third fatty acid chain, it instead has what's called a phosphate group here. So we can see the phosphate group on the left hand side docked into this glycerol molecule at the station where the third fatty acid chain would normally exist in a triglyceride, but it's not there. Now phospholipids, as we mentioned before, are the fundamental unit that comprises the membranes of cells. And so the biological role of lipids is, again, complex because while regular lipids are used for long-term energy storage in the form of fats, phospholipids are equally important because they are a type of lipid that is the main structural unit in cell membranes, as we can see on the right-hand side here. Now we have one more checkpoint here about dehydration reactions. In this one, I want you to tell me how many water molecules would be generated from the dehydration reactions involved in creating two molecules of triglyceride. Now, before we move on from lipids entirely and onto the next category of macromolecule, there's a few other things that I wanted to mention to you guys because these are relevant things that you hear about in relation to fats. One of them is saturated versus unsaturated fats, two different categories of fats that you may see on your nutrition label. The difference between a saturated and unsaturated fat comes down to whether or not the fatty acid chains contained within that fat molecule have all single bonds between their carbon atoms or if they have at least one double bond. A saturated fat contains fatty acids that only have single bonds between all of their carbon atoms, as you see on the top here. This means that every single carbon atom is in a covalent bond where it shares only a single pair of electrons with the next carbon atom. An unsaturated fatty acid, on the other hand, has at least one double bond meaning that at least one pair of carbon atoms in the chain of the fatty acid shares two pairs of electrons with its neighbor. Saturation refers to the level of hydrogen that fits in the fatty acid chain, which depends upon whether there are single bonds or double bonds. As you can see in the upper fatty acid here, 
this fatty acid is saturated, or in other words, completely full of the maximum number of hydrogen atoms that it could possibly contain. The unsaturated fatty acid is unsaturated in the sense that it is not completely full of the maximum number of hydrogen atoms that it could contain, because these two carbon atoms, instead of sharing electrons with another hydrogen atom, have chosen to share electrons with each other instead. So that's the significance of saturation versus unsaturation. Now what does that mean to you and your diet? Well, research continues to investigate the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats on our health, but the current body of evidence seems to indicate that unsaturated fats are healthier than saturated fats, because saturated fats are capable of raising your cholesterol levels in an unhealthy way. And an easy way to tell the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats is based upon what state they are in at room temperature. Saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature, so this includes things like butter or lard or coconut butter. Uh, unsaturated fats are things like oils, like olive oil, vegetable oil, canola oil. Um, these at room temperature will be liquid instead of solid. So that's how you can tell the difference. So we're now moving on from lipids to our next class of macromolecules which is going to be the nucleic acids. This, remember, is the one that you don't find on your nutrition label because it is genetic material, DNA. The nucleic acids are composed of a separate type of building block that is not the building block that makes up carbohydrates, nor is it the building block that makes up lipids. It's a building block called a nucleotide. A nucleotide is a very complex building block because within it, there are actually three different components. Overall, together, all three of these things together are a nucleotide. But within them, we can identify three separate pieces. There is a sugar, which I've highlighted here in green. There is a phosphate group, highlighted here. And then finally, something called a nitrogenous base, highlighted in the upper right. So these are the three basic components of a nucleotide, but it's actually a little bit more complex than that because some of these components have different versions that they can take on. The nitrogenous base, for example, which is the component that you see in the upper right here, the nitrogenous base can be one of five different chemical structures. Those chemical structures are called cytosine, uracil, thymine, guanine, and adenine. And they're divided into two different groups by scientists. The ones that have a single chemical ring are called pyrimidines, and this includes cytosine, uracil, and thymine. The nitrogenous bases that have two conjoined chemical rings are purines, and those are guanine and adenine. So the nitrogenous base within a nucleotide can be any one of these five different things. Likewise, the sugar component of the nucleotide can be one of two different things. It can either be ribose or deoxyribose. Now, why does that matter? Why does it matter that these different components of the nucleotide can be different things? It matters because there are actually two different major types of nucleic acid found inside of living organisms, and those are DNA and RNA. DNA you are probably familiar with. RNA you may not be. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. And the difference in the names of these two different types of nucleic acid molecules draws from the type of sugar that is found in its building blocks. Deoxyribose is the name of the sugar that is found in DNA. And again, we can see that sugars end in OSE. This is not the type of sugar that you would eat, though, or that would taste sweet. This is a type of sugar that is actually found in genetic material. Over here, we have a different type of sugar 
also still ending in O-S-E. Ribose. And so ribonucleic acid is named ribonucleic acid because it contains the sugar ribose as its building block. Deoxyribonucleic acid is named for the fact that it contains deoxyribose in its building blocks. And on a molecular level, you can see that deoxyribose and ribose are almost identical to each other. This chemical on the left is almost identical to the chemical on the right, with the only exception being that ribose has an oxygen right here, while deoxyribose does not. And that makes sense when we think about the names of the sugars. Deoxyribose is a ribose that has been deoxygenated. There is one less oxygen in deoxyribose than there is in ribose, and that is the only difference between them. Another major difference between DNA and RNA is in the nitrogenous bases that are found within them. So we know that there are five different possible nitrogenous bases that can be found in the building blocks of a nucleotide. However, in DNA, only four of them are present. And those four are cytosine, thymine, guanine, and adenine. The nitrogenous base uracil is never found in molecules of DNA. On the other hand, in RNA, thymine is never seen. Instead, the four bases cytosine, uracil, guanine, and adenine are found. So in other words, in DNA, there are no U's, and in RNA, there are no T's. A final difference between the structure of DNA and RNA is in what's called their strandedness. So when individual nucleotides link to each other, as we are going to see momentarily, they form a long strand, which may or may not come together with a partner strand. In DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, every individual strand of nucleotides will join up with a partner strand and link together, and therefore DNA is considered double-stranded. In RNA, that is generally not the case. When nucleotides form into a long strand, that strand will remain solo rather than bonding to a partner. So let's take a look now at how these strands form in the first place. Here we have two separate building blocks that have not yet conjoined to each other. I'm going to highlight the atoms once again that are going to be involved in the dehydration reaction that will connect the two in order to create a strand of nucleic acid. On the upper nucleotide, we can see that I've highlighted a hydrogen that is part of the sugar component of that nucleotide. On the lower nucleotide, we can see that I have highlighted an oxygen and a hydrogen together that is part of the phosphate group on this nucleotide. These are the three atoms, the two hydrogens and the oxygen, that will come together and leave their partners in order to form a separate water molecule, which makes it possible for the two nucleotides to then form a new bond to each other. And now we've linked the two nucleotides through a dehydration reaction. Now, once again, if we just link two nucleotides, that doesn't really form a strand of DNA. It's when this process happens over and over again that you get long strands of nucleotides that then form a nucleic acid, which can be either a DNA or RNA molecule. So what is the biological role of nucleic acids? What do they do for living organisms? Well, just think about what you know DNA does. Nucleic acids in general store and transmit genetic information. And they have the power to do that because the sequence of different nitrogenous bases found in their nucleotides, the adenines, guanines, cytosines, and thiamines, etc., are able to spell out instructions for how an organism should function and what its structure should look like. And we will talk much more about this in future chapters when we address DNA in more detail. For right now, we're going to tackle another checkpoint here where I have a picture of a nucleotide on the screen. And I want you to tell me whether this type of building block that you see here would be found in DNA or RNA, and 
how do you know that it would be found in DNA or RNA? What's your reasoning? So this brings us now to our final category of macromolecules that we have yet to talk about, and that is the proteins. We saved the best for last because the proteins require a little bit more discussion than the other classes of macromolecules. But we'll start in the same place as we did with the other three classes by talking about what the monomers of proteins are. The monomers of proteins are called amino acids. And you can see a representation of what an amino acid looks like on a molecular level on the left-hand side of this slide. An amino acid, sort of like a nucleotide, has a complex structure with multiple internal parts that we can identify. Every amino acid contains a central carbon atom, and we can see that central carbon atom right here, that is bonded to four different things. One is an amino group. You can see that on the left-hand side. That's part of the namesake of the amino acid. Next, a carboxylic acid group on the right-hand side. And again, you can see that that's part of the namesake of amino acid as well. Up top, we have a hydrogen atom. And then down below, we have something called a quote-unquote R group. And that R group actually can vary in its chemical structure. It can be many different things. For example, in the amino acid known as glycine, the R group is simply a single hydrogen atom. In the amino acid known as aspartic acid, the R group is much more complex. In the amino acid known as serine, it's different still. And in fact, there are 20 different types of R groups that are found on amino acids. And all of them are displayed here for you to see. Now this chart has nicely divided the amino acids into different categories based upon the chemical nature of the structure of their R group. All of the amino acids that are listed in this upper category right here, all of these amino acids have a nonpolar R group, meaning that within their R group, the electrons are shared equally across the atoms that are engaging in covalent sharing bonds. Down below the nonpolar group, we can see the polar amino acids. And you may remember that polar is the opposite of nonpolar. What this means is that the atoms in the R group of these amino acids are not sharing their electrons equally between them, and so they have these dipoles that have a slight positive or negative charge to them. And then finally, at the bottom, we have a category that is a full-blown electrically charged amino acid, meaning that it's not just sharing electrons unequally with a partner, it has either lost or gained electrons entirely. On the left-hand side, we have two amino acids that have an overall negative charge because they have gained an electron. And although it's hard to see, that negative charge is localized, on these oxygen atoms right here. You can see the little tick mark in the upper right of that oxygen indicating that it has a negative charge associated with it because it gained an electron. Over here, we have three amino acids that have the opposite of that. They have a positive charge because they have lost an electron. And again, although it's hard to see, uh, there's a little plus sign localized around these nitrogen and hydrogen clusters here indicating that there is a positive electrical charge on these three amino acids. Now, based upon what we learned in our previous lecture, I want you to tell me which of these two amino acids would be able to dissolve in water, asparagine or tryptophan, and why? So based upon what you learned about nonpolar and polar things dissolving in water, which one, asparagine or tryptophan, and you'll have to find these in the chart, would be able to dissolve in water and why? And after you do that, I want you to tell me a pair of amino acids that would exhibit an electrical attraction to each other. So just as we've done with the previous categories of macromolecules, 
we're going to take a look at how a dehydration reaction mediates the bonding of two separate amino acids in order to start forming a macromolecule. So here I have two generic amino acids here on the slide. Uh, they're separate from each other, and we can see that the R group is simply represented with the letter R, indicating that it can be variable, they're not a specific amino acid. Again, I will highlight the atoms that are involved in this reaction. I'm picking up the OH from the left hand and the H from the right hand amino acid. These three are the ones that will get together and form a molecule of H2O, leaving behind the opening for the left hand amino acid to bond to the right hand one, and for the two to come together to form a two unit molecule here. Now this in itself again is not a protein, but when you do this over and over again and get a long chain of these monomers together, that's when you have a protein on your hands. And here's what such a protein might look like with various side chains filled in instead of the generic R groups. Now the thing about proteins that makes them a little bit more complex than other types of macromolecules is they don't sit nicely as chains like this. And in fact, they have this complex folding behavior that allows them to take on a three-dimensional shape. The chain that you see right here might look something like the chain that you see on the upper part of this slide, but it won't remain like this. And instead, it will form patterns um, and three-dimensional shapes which fold on each other in various ways that allow it to assume the complex structure of the protein. We're going to go into more detail about how this folding process happens, how the chain becomes the 3D shape. But before we do that, let's take a look at the role that proteins play in living organisms, which is a very important one. Proteins are the most versatile of the different macromolecule categories. Their role can be structural, meaning that they could make up part of the structure of an organism. For example, the collagen protein that is found in humans composes our tendons and connective tissue. Keratin is another protein. That's the one that you see right here. This is the primary protein found in uh, hair strands. Proteins can also be functional. For example, hemoglobin is an essential protein that is found inside of your red blood cells, and it is responsible for picking up oxygen from the lungs and carrying it through your bloodstream to all of your organs and tissues. And finally, proteins can be catalytic. Most enzymes are proteins, and what an enzyme is, is a biological agent that speeds up a chemical reaction. Enzymes are essential for living organisms, and we will talk much more about enzymes in future chapters. But for right now, all you need to know is that enzymes are made of protein. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to get back to this question of how is it that proteins assume a complex three-dimensional shape from the simple amino acid chain that represents their primary structure. Before we talk in detail about this, I'm going to show you guys a quick video which I think will kind of prime your brains for understanding this process by showing you in three-dimensional terms how proteins fold. Proteins are building blocks that help give your body structure and do work around your body. They move molecules, they make new molecules, they recycle old molecules, and this is just to name a few of the things that they do. But maybe the most interesting thing is that these protein building blocks are themselves made up of smaller building blocks called amino acids. Here you can see a string of amino acids. The different shapes that you can see represent the atoms that make up each amino acid. And here we've highlighted 12 individual amino acids. To make it simpler, each different amino acid can be represented by a single letter. Now each amino acid is shown as a colored ball, looking like beads on a string. This makes the protein structure 
easier to imagine. The order of amino acids is only part of the story. Because of the different shapes of the individual amino acids, they like to fold into even more interesting three-dimensional shapes. This molecule is twisting into several different spiral or helical shapes, and then those are folding on each other. Take a look at the three-dimensional shape as we give the protein a spin. Kind of looks like logs stacked in a fireplace. Here is the one-letter amino acid code revealing the identity of each amino acid. Again, now you see the amino acids drawn to show the position of each atom. This is like looking at an atomic skeleton of each amino acid. Just like you take up more space than just your skeleton would, see how much space each atom really occupies. This is the real shape of the protein. Now we've seen an example of a protein taking shape, and several of the ways scientists visualize these tiny building blocks used throughout your body. So now that you've seen how proteins fold, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the chemical forces that cause this process to happen. As was mentioned, the primary structure of a protein is simply the chain of amino acids that are all connected together through dehydration reactions in one long string. But the proteins do not remain as simple as one long string, they take on a 3D shape. The secondary protein structure is the way that a protein folds into patterns based upon the formation of hydrogen bonds between amino acids. So there are two common secondary protein structures that form as a result of hydrogen bonds between different amino acids. One of them is called the pleated sheet, and that's what you see on the left, and the other is called the alpha helix, and that's what you see on the right. So these are two very common simple shapes that the primary structure of a protein can take on as a result of hydrogen bonding. But even more complex than this is when the simple sheets and helices form into the tertiary structure of the protein. So the tertiary structure is what you get when those secondary patterns collapse on each other to fold this more complex 3D shape. The reason why tertiary structure forms is a result mainly of two different chemical forces, and that is hydrophobic effect, which we've talked about before, and electrostatic interactions between amino acids that have the capability of being electrically attracted to each other. So let's talk first about the hydrophobic effect. We learned that the hydrophobic effect describes the way that nonpolar chemical compounds try to avoid contact with water because they cannot dissolve in it. And this is exemplified by the fact that oil forms a separate layer with water because it is nonpolar and hydrophobic. This also happens within chains of amino acids because, as we know, certain R groups within amino acids are nonpolar and therefore hydrophobic. And those amino acids are interspersed with other amino acids that are polar and therefore not hydrophobic, rather hydrophilic. They like water. A chain of amino acids will fold in such a way that the nonpolar and hydrophobic amino acids can get tucked away at the center of the protein structure and protected from exposure to water. At the same time, the hydrophilic or water-loving polar amino acids will point outward so that they can maximize their exposure to water. And this satisfies the chemistry of both the polar and nonpolar amino acids. Just like oil spontaneously separates itself from water, this process will spontaneously happen in order to protect the hydrophobic amino acids and expose the polar amino acids to water. So the hydrophobic effect is one of the forces that allows the tertiary complex 3D shape of the protein to form from those secondary patterns. Another one is electrostatic interactions. 
which are more simple because it simply means that positively charged amino acids will be attracted to other amino acids that have a negative charge and vice versa. So these attractions can also dictate which areas of the protein become next to each other or situated together in that 3D shape. A final force that can cause the 3D shape of a protein to take form is something called a disulfide bridge, highlighted here in the center of this image. Now, a disulfide bridge is a more minor reason why the tertiary structure arises. It's not as important as electrostatic interactions or hydrophobic effect, but it still is interesting, and I'll show you why. Disulfide bridges are connections that can form specifically between multiple cysteine amino acids. Cysteine is an amino acid that contains the element sulfur in its R group, and therefore it is able to form other connections to cysteine amino acids and bond their sulfurs together in what's called a disulfide bridge. Now, Disulfide bridges are interesting because they are the primary force involved in hair curling. Keratin, as we mentioned before, is the main protein found in hair, and it contains these cysteine amino acids, which can form disulfide bridges with each other. The more disulfide bridges are present in a person's hair, the curlier their hair will be. And furthermore, applying heat to the keratin in the hair breaks that disulfide bridge, it breaks the bond between the adjacent sulfur atoms, which causes the curly hair to then become straight. And that is the principle behind straightening your hair with a flat iron, for example. The final level of protein structure is called the quaternary protein structure. And the quaternary structure is what you get when more than one amino acid chain in its tertiary form, clumps together to form this multi-unit structure. Now this doesn't happen in all proteins. Some proteins are only made of a single amino acid chain, but others have a quaternary structure where they're made of multiple amino acid chains that have clumped in a specific manner. An example is one that we mentioned before, and that is the protein hemoglobin, which is responsible for picking up oxygen from your lungs and carrying it to your organs and tissues in your red blood cells, hemoglobin has a quaternary structure where it is actually made up of four separate amino acid chains that are all clumped together to give it its final form. Now, if any of this sounds remotely interesting to you, and if you're the sort of person who likes puzzles or games, um, then I have a recommendation for you. It is an online game called Fold It. And Fold It is interesting because it allows you to actually work with real life proteins to try to figure out their structure by balancing the different considerations such as electrostatic interactions and the hydrophobic effect and disulfide bridges to find their true form. And this is a game that, that the public can play. There are over 750,000 users of this game, but it can actually yield real scientific discoveries. For example, Foldit is currently being used to try to find different therapies to treat coronavirus. Um, users of the game Foldit were able to come up with the structure of 99 different proteins, which were found to interfere with the way that coronavirus infects human cells. And now those 99 structures, which game players came up with, are actually being made in the lab and tested as potential therapies for coronavirus. Um, so if this is interesting to you and you want to try it out, I would highly recommend it. I have just a few checkpoints here, and then we're going to take a look back at where we started this lecture when we talked about the Hadean period of the Earth's atmosphere and the Miller-Urey experiment. But before we do that, um, what I want you to do in this checkpoint is match the macromolecule with the name of the monomer that composes it. And in this checkpoint, I want you to match the macromolecule 
with its function in biological organisms. So now let's get back to that experiment that I mentioned way back at the beginning of the lecture, where Miller and Urey tried to recreate the early Earth atmosphere and see if they could create the molecular basis for life under these conditions. Let's talk about what they actually found. One of the things that Miller and Urey found in their basin when they finished running their experiment was the molecule that you see on the left here. Tell me in this checkpoint which macromolecule would be formed from this molecular building block. And it turns out that later, scientists repeated similar experiments to what Miller and Urey did, and they found the molecule that you see on the left. Again, tell me which macromolecule classification could be formed from this molecular building block. And we're on the final stretch here. I promise we're almost done. There are two checkpoints left, and in both of them, what I want you to do is identify what type of biological molecule we're looking at and the name of the functional group that is in the red circle. So what is this molecule and what is that functional group? And here's the last one, checkpoint 12. What is this molecule and what is that functional group?